If you will, turn your Bibles over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to talk a little bit this morning. Now, on your outline, we had a little bit of a communication problem. Uh, you heard about uh, the two elderly men that were very hard to hear, and they decided they'd go for a walk one afternoon, and so they're walking in, in, in the park. It's really hot. And one, of the, one of the men said to the other one, uh, it sure is windy today. And his reply was, it's not Wednesday, it's Thursday. And to that he replied, you know, I'm thirsty too. Let's go get some water. <laughs> so uh, Lucy and I kind of had that moment. Uh, it's, I think she's got in the, the outline a little bit different than what I intended for it to be. It should be not displaying disobedience, but dislodging disobedience, dislodging disobedience. You know, we want to unclutter our hearts. And one of the things we want to get out of our hearts is disobedience. Uh, most people appreciate it when those under their authority do what they've been asked to do without a lot of resistance. Uh, if you're a boss, a supervisor, you may have people uh, that work for you that you can tell them what to do and they just get right on it. Then you've got those others that are hard-headed and they won't do it and they have to be prompted and have to be prompted or you have to go through an argument with them and you have to give all these reasons. And you really appreciate that guy, that woman or that man that will do what you want them to do. One time when I was growing up, we hired a fellow that we had a, a lot of hopes in that he was going to do a good job and uh, we were going to get him to do some other work. He was going to paint our house. And yet it, it seemed like he had never ever heard of the concept that the customer is always right. Or every once in a while, right? You've ever dealt with somebody like that? But he was always wanting to change and wanting to do it his way. And uh, we finally got the house painted. And that was as far as our relationship with him went. Because he always wanted to do what he wanted to do. And he nearly didn't understand the relationship that we're the customer. He's the fellow that's doing the painting. And he needs to do what was asked to do. Because we're paying him to do that. Not to change it and do what he wants to do. Well, the same thing is even true. James Dobson, for instance, uh, in, in families. James Dobson wrote, wrote a book one time. He, uh, I forgot the name of it. Uh, I think it was Strong-Willed Child, in which he talks about what the strong-willed child looks like compared to the compliant-willed child. And, uh, you know, the, the strong-willed child was this one that if you tell him what to do, he looks at you like you got to be kidding, where the compliant child, the compliant one, always will say, yes, mom, or yes, dad, and go on and do what want to be done. Well, we appreciate that. And, and God is the same with us. And, and he loves us, and we, like we love our children. We always want to reward our children for doing what's right and uh, what's best. We seem like we always favor children when they are obedient as opposed to not favoring them on some things when they don't do what you want to do. And the reason is, is because we are made in the image of God. And uh, God, you see, uses rewards and favors those of his children who obey him because of a number of reasons. He rewards us and he favors us when we obey him. Number one, because we understand the nature of our relationship with him. God is the one who is in charge. And when we say that he is Lord of our life, you know what that means? That means we do what he says. It's not that we do what we want to do, but we do what the Lord says. And so we understand the relationship that we have with God. And God rewards us and favors us, secondly, because when we obey Him, that shows Him that we respect His judgments. His judgment. God always, just like a good parent, wants to do what is right and what is best for a child. I don't know any loving parent that would ever ever lead their children in the wrong direction. Now, they may mistakenly lead them in that direction, but they wouldn't intentionally do that. God is not intentionally going to lead us in the wrong direction. Whatever He wants us to do, and He wants us to obey, it is going to be because He knows, and we know that He is going to do what is best. And then, number three, not only do we understand the nature when we're obedient, and we obey because we respect His judgment, but we trust his motives. 
God is never going to have a bad motive. And we looked at one of the reasons that God is righteous and holy is because He never has an ulterior motive. Whatever He says for us to do, whatever the compliance of obedience is, it's because it's the right thing to do for us. And then number four, we obey Him just like with parents. We obey children, obey their children, uh, parents because they love Him. You know, one of the reasons that I want to obey God is because I want to please Him. I want to make Him happy. And that means that I do what... If it's always an argument every time I look at a commandment of God and I want to argue with God about it, and I'm not going to obey it. I don't see it that way. I don't want it to be that way. Well, you see, there's something wrong with the relationship. I am not expressing the love that I ought to express. The word obedience is not a word that requires a great deal of explanation. Uh, to God, uh, to obey God means that we do what we are asked to do. And I want you to listen as Jesus places a premium on obedience. We will look at just a couple of verses here in John 3, 4, and 6. Look in John chapter 3, verse 36. Jesus now, he has talked to uh, some folks about the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And continuing with this thought... John kind of sums up the teachings of Jesus in verse 36 by saying, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now I want you to listen to what he says. Listen to this very carefully. He who believes on the Son of God has eternal life. Now we understand that. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God will be upon him. Now notice that Jesus uses believes and obey as the same thing. He said, he who believes has eternal life, but he who fails to obey has the wrath of God on him. You see, he is using in that statement, believing in Jesus and obeying Jesus as being one and the same concept. You can't believe in Jesus and not obey Him. You cannot consistently obey Jesus without believing Him. And so that gives a, a totally different take on this idea of believing in Jesus, doesn't it? You know, these words here, believe and obey, are used interchangeably. Uh, and, and what is belief and obedience? Why do they go together? Well, I did a little study on the word that is used there for belief, and incidentally, it's the same Greek word, a root word, that is used for obey. Some versions use the word, he who believes will have eternal life, and he who does not believe will not see eternal life. It's the same word, the same concept. And the concept is this. Believing in Jesus is different, or it, it means an outward result. What is an outward result? That's obedience. Obedience is showing my belief, that which is inside me. See, I can say, I believe in Jesus. But if I don't live that way, guess what? I don't have a belief. Now, I may mentally assent that I believe in Jesus. But you know, this morning, if I chose to go do something else. If I chose to spend my money in a different way, if I chose to pursue the world rather than pursuing God, then I can't say that, oh, I can say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but yet I'm not outwardly showing. It can't be seen. It can't be observed. It can't be measured. This inward persuasion and belief. Let me kind of illustrate this. There was a man that was totally deaf, and he lived a couple of miles from the church building, and he would walk to church every Sunday. He'd walk to church. One of his neighbors saw him, and you know, you could just about set your clock by the fact that old John's going to be walking by here in just a few minutes going to church. One day he was out working his fences, and he ran into a neighboring farmer who had been observing him walk to church. And so... He was talking, and, and this neighbor said, You know, John, there's something that I wanted to ask you. I've been intending to ask you for some time now. 
You're deaf. You go to church, and I just don't understand why you go to church. You can't hear the songs that are sung. No. You can't hear the prayers that are prayed. No. You can't hear the sermon that is preached. No. Then why on this earth do you continue to go to church? And I love this man's answer. He said, I may not can hear the songs. I may not can hear the prayers. I may not can hear the sermon. But I want my neighbors to know whose side I'm on. I want my neighbors to know whose side I'm on. Turn in your song books to number 760. I want you to look at a song with me. Hal leads us in this song from time to time, and we really don't have the, the time this morning to sing this song, but just look at the first verse of 760. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey? Are you listening for God's orders? Are you ready to obey who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? Just like that old farmer, I'm on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. You see the importance of what Jesus is saying when he said, He who believes in me shall have eternal life, but he who does not obey me, eternal damnation abides in him. And then look with me in John chapter 4 and verse 34. And Jesus, now you remember this is the story where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. His disciples had gone into town to get food and to bring it back because it was noontime. And so they bring the, the food back and the disciples in verse 33 were saying to one another, no one brought anything to eat did, uh, for him to eat, did he? In other words, they had asked him back up earlier, uh, go ahead and eat. But Jesus said in verse 32, I have food to eat which you do not know about. And they're going, well, did somebody bring him some food while we were gone? Well, listen to what Jesus says in verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus was serious about obedience. This morning, we can say, oh, we believe in Jesus. But the question is, does your outward expression of faith show or does it have voids in it? When you say, I believe in Jesus. Jesus says, my food is to do his will and to accomplish his work. Look in chapter 6 in verse 38. Chapter 6 verse 38. Jesus has just referenced food again. He said that I'm the, the bread of life. He talked about the children of Israel, how they labored for the manna. And he says, I'm the true manna that comes down from heaven. And in verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Am I doing God's will? That's the question. Now, you know... Let's, let's think for just a moment about obedience, the obedience that God desires. And ask yourself this question. Is the driving passion of my life the desire to do what God wills for me to do? Is that my desiring passion? Is the first thing I do when my feet hit the floor in the morning, say, Lord, Today, I want to be pleasing to you. I want to obey you. I want to do your will. The last thing you do when you pick those feet up off the floor and put them back in bed and you turn to God in prayer, you say, God, I pray that I have been pleasing and I have done your will today. Is that your over, 
over uh, your, your driving desire and passion in life. You know, we got to be honest with ourselves now, folks. You see, Jesus not only talked about obedience, but he demonstrated this in three important facets of the kind of obedience that God desires from us. Now, you may want to write these down. I left a space for you to write these down. Three ways that Jesus obeyed. Number one, his obedience was immediate obedience. It was immediate, immediate obedience. In other words, Jesus didn't say, well, one of these days I'm going to get around to obeying the Lord. We sometimes think that, well, I, I, I intend to. And see, intentions are not what we're looking for here. There was a man who said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And that's true, isn't it? What I intended to do does not count. What I do or what I don't do is going to be important before the judgment bar of God. In Mark chapter 10 and in verse 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve that he may give his life as a ransom for many. Now notice what Jesus said. He said, my life was not for me to be served. It was for me to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. In other words, I've got some immediate pressing work for the Lord that has got to be done. It needs to be done and I'm going to do it. And then number two, not only was his obedience immediate obedience, but it was complete obedience. It was complete obedience. No man obeys God truly who does not endeavor to obey God fully. You know, that's a pretty good thought right there. Now, I, didn't, I, I just kind of copied this from somebody. But listen to this. No man, no, no man obeys God truly who does not endeavor to obey God completely. It's complete obedience. Uh, we sometimes look at obedience like this Bible is a menu at a restaurant. You ever go to a restaurant and eat? You probably got a favorite restaurant you like to go to. You flip through the menu and what are you doing? You're looking for what you would like to have. Well, sometimes we look at the Bible as, well, let me find something that, that I would, well, that sounds like I'd like to do that and it's easy to do. But what about all these other things? Well, I don't like them, so I won't worry about them. I'll just forget about them. You know, the Bible says, and we're real big on this, going to all the world and preach the gospel. He that is baptized shall be saved, and he that baptized shall not shall be condemned. And we really are strong on that part about baptism. But let me ask you something. What about verse 15? It said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Are we as big on that as we are on baptism? Well, sometimes I wonder. But when you look at the Bible as a menu that I can just pick and choose what I want to obey and not obey, I get into a lot of trouble. Because God is going to judge me on what I'm doing, and I've got to endeavor to fully obey God. To fully obey God. One of the greatest attitudes that you'll find that Jesus possessed is in Philippians 2 and verse 8. Listen to what Paul said about, about Jesus. He said, being found in appearance as a man. He's referring to Jesus as he came incarnate into human history and was crucified. He said, for he was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now you see, Jesus, he endeavored to fully obey God. See, he could have said... Well, I'll come and I'll heal the sick. I'll feed the poor. I'll preach the gospel to them. But I'm not going to die for them. You see, that wouldn't be full obedience, would it? He said that he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death on the cross. Now, that's endeavoring full obedience. The Old Testament is filled with illustration after e illustration, example after il example of people who tried to pick and choose their obedience and it got them in trouble. For instance, there's Achan. You remember Achan who kept, uh, he, he went to the battle with Israel against Jericho and they were told don't take any of the spoils of war. 
that all this is to be given to the Lord or burned. And yet he kept gold and silver and some Babylonian uh, clothing. And what happened to Achan for doing that? I mean, it's just a few spoils of victory. What happened to him? He was stoned. What about King Saul? Simply because he decided to spare a few sheep, he was removed from being king. God said, you destroy everything. Well, the people wanted to keep some sheep and sacrifice them. And what did the Samuel, the prophet, tell him? He said, to hearken is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than the fat of rams. So you see, we can't pick and choose. How about Uzzah? He touched the Ark of the Covenant. And he had good intentions. He didn't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall on the ground. And so he put his hand on it to steady it. What happened? He fell dead. Why? Because the law said you don't touch the Ark of the Covenant. Now you see, obedience is important if I want to be pleasing to God. God wants total obedience, not partial obedience. And then number three, Jesus had what I call joyful obedience. He was willing to obey the Lord, not begrudgingly, but he was willing to obey out of joy. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to stop right here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I want you to notice the kind of obedience that Jesus had. It was immediate obedience. It was complete obedience. And it was joyful obedience. Look in verses 2, 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, seeing we have so great a cloud of witnesses, he's referring to all these people in chapter 11 and the roll call of faith. He said, Seeing that we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or sin and weight that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. Now I want you to listen to this next part. Who... For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice what he says. Jesus obeyed. Why? For the joy that was set before him. He obeyed joyfully, not begrudgingly. He didn't get up and say, oh man, you mean I got to go out and talk to those people again today? You mean I got to go to the cross? He for the joy set before him. And you see, we're to have joyful obedience. You know what? One of the things that can take the joy out of obeying God. Let me illustrate it. I read this illustration a number of years ago, and it really has stuck with me. And I guess because it is such an amazing story. Of course, it isn't true, but. Nevertheless, there was this woman named Mary, as the story goes. She had a husband by the name of Jeff, and Jeff was a demanding old scoundrel. I mean, he was tough on her, and uh, he was hard and demanding, and she worked to please him. Every day, she would go and sit down and review everything that she had done, and she was always nervous that she wasn't going to please him, that he wasn't going to be happy with what uh, she had done for him today. And so every day they would sit in the living room. He would sit in his chair and she would sit in a smaller chair beside him. And she would go over everything to make sure that she had done everything exactly the way Jeff wanted it done. Because she wanted him happy and she wanted to please him above anything. Well, Jeff got sick and died. And she just held on to Jeff so strongly that she didn't want to bury him. And so she had... This thought, and so she had him mounted, you know, stuffed. And so she brought him home, stuffed, and put him in his chair. And every day she would go by and sit down and review everything she had done that day to to Jeff. You know, he's sitting there, he's dead, he's gone, but yet he's still there. Well, years passed by, and she went on a cruise, and she met a man on the cruise by the name of Roger, and Roger lived in Florida, and so. They, this, it was like love at first sight, and so Roger and Mary get married, and they decide they're going to move back to where she lived. And he, now, now, he's never been to her home where Jeff and Mary lived. And so 
He walks in the door, and there sits Jeff in this chair, and of course his mouth just drops open. I mean, he was never so surprised in his life to see that here comes in the new love, but the old love is still sitting there. And he became angry. And he said, let me tell you, either he goes or I go. Because I'm not going to have your past love living in the same house with your present love. And you know, that's the way life is. If I really want to obey God, even though I am baptized and I have died to sin, I can still bring my old self back into the house and want to please that old dead self? Well, guess what? Jesus is just like Roger. He says, as long as you're trying to please yourself, you cannot please me. Isn't that right? You can't please the Lord as long as you're trying to please the old dead self. And this morning, when we die to self, that means we get rid of our wants, our wishes, our needs, and we start looking at what makes God happy. And in turn, that's what makes us happy. But see, you can't do it as long as the old dead self is still in the house with you. This morning, do you need to get rid of that old dead self? Maybe this morning you need to die to self. You need to repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Obedience. Let's dislodge disobedience out of our life. And let's like the, the Lord set for the joy, endure and obey. Won't you come as we stand and sing?